You know, I was thinking in the week that that I always say good morning when I greet you. But it may not be morning where you are when this recording goes live um, at 8 o'clock Sunday morning South African time. Or you may be watching it later in the week, in the evening. So today, let me rather say hello there, welcome, whatever the time of day is where you are. My name is Peter de Villiers and I'm with Villiersdorp Community Church in South Africa. In the description below you'll find all our contact details and links to the virtual platforms. Use them, check us out and if you haven't done so don't forget to click on the subscribe button and subscribe to our channel. Now we've been working our way through the book of Hosea. Today we are at chapter 11. I'm going to read the chapter, but before I do, let me pray. Father God, we want to thank you for being a father. Thank you for being a father who hears us when we pray. Thank you for being there in our times of joy and sadness. Now prayer now is that you would break into our hearts and our minds with Hosea chapter 11 and meet us there where we are with whatever we're facing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hosea 11 When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zebuim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God, not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt, trembling like sparrows, from Assyria, fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, Israel with deceit, and Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful Holy One. Now, the book of Hosea started off with a strange marriage between Hosea, Hosea, God's prophet, and the prostitute Gomer. And the strange thing was that it was God that had instructed Hosea to get married to this prostitute. But we saw that this marriage had the purpose of dramatizing both God's love for his people, but also his people's rebellion against him. And that was covered in the first three chapters of the book. Then came chapters 4 to 10. Now we could say that the theme of chapters 4 to 10 was that of judgment. I mean, how many times in those chapters didn't we see judgment that, that would come by way of war, that would have Israel taken into exile? But now we get chapter 11. And it's almost as if in this chapter we, we get the judgment of chapters 4 to 10, but we also get the intense love, like, like that of Hosea, which had him going after Gomer, even though she had left him to go after her lovers. 
Now let's look at chapter 11. And as the first point, I've got God's love for rebellious people. Now in verses 1 to 4, we get two images. Two images that stand in stark contrast to each other. And the images are firstly, God as a loving father. And secondly, Israel as a child of this father, but a child that, that turned its back to this loving father. So Isaiah tells us of Israel's past. And the picture we get is, is that of a happy past. See, these first four verses are so emotive that, that when reading them, they move you. You get the picture of a loving father teaching his children to walk. And this father lovingly cares for his children. And you get the picture of this father calling and calling and calling after his children. Yet, yet the more he calls, the more they turn their backs on him. When Ezra was young and in need of redemption from slavery, God loved his people. You know, there are many examples of how God loved them, but, but none other demonstrate his love as does the deliverance from slavery in Egypt. But after following God out of Egypt, this son that God so loved, in other words, the Israelites, they rebelled and they they rather listened to the call from the Baals. It sounds foolish, doesn't it? I mean, heeding the call from so-called gods that never loved them, can't love them, rather than the call from the loving father. This four gives such a picture of gentleness and kindness and, and love. Let me read it again. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Very similar to chapters 1 to 3, with, with Hosea's love for his prostitute wife, not so. Let's think about this. So, so we have Israel spending 430 years in Egypt under the worst slavery imaginable. But then here comes God who with gentleness and love promises them a land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, what would you choose? Slavery or milk and honey and land and, and blessings? And then in verses 5 to 7, we get to the judgment section, which is similar to chapters 4 to 10. I've called this point punishment. Now, the logical thing when being on the receiving end of such tender love would be to be drawn toward it. One would expect them to, to follow this loving God to the land he promised them and they enjoy his blessings. But instead of this, the Israelites will end up losing their land and returning to Egypt and Assyria as slaves. And why will this happen? Well, verse 5 says, Will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? You know, this is a tragedy that is unfolding. They simply won't repent and return to worshipping God alone. Verse 7 even says that it is with determination that they turn away from God, away from the one who loves them and who has given them their own land and, and who wants to prosper them there. It doesn't make sense, does it? So yes, God loves them, but... The time will come when his patience will run out and they will be punished. And the punishment will come in the form of a bitter war which, which will result in them being taken into exile to Egypt and to Syria. So we have this intense love of God for his people. And their response is rejection, to which God responds with punishment. You know, to many people today, this is a problem. 
Many people today will respond to this and say, but how can it be that a God of love will destroy his own people through war? For many people today, this is a valid reason not to believe in God. Now that brings us to verses 8 to 9. And I've called this point, how can God do this? Now, we need to see that this judgment from God did not come from some vindictiveness or revenge. On the contrary, the picture we get is of a father who has tried absolutely everything to lead his children on a path of blessing and peace. But nothing worked. In verses 8 and 9, we even see that, that God struggles with his decision to punish the Israelites. You know, we may ask, but how can God do this? But here we see God asking, how can I do this? You know, this question that God asks of himself doesn't indicate that he's confused or that he doesn't know what to do. But we see here an expression of his intense love. And I don't think we'll be uh, too far wrong if, if we also see some anxiety um, in God's asking this question of himself. You see, God isn't a stone-cold judge sitting on a throne waiting to pounce on those that step out of line. But we see in these questions that, that God is in intensely and personally involved with his people in a way that goes far beyond the simple legalities of do's and don'ts. In verse 8 we read, How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Admar? How can I make you like Zebuim? Now why this mention of Admar and Zebuim? You know, if I were to ask you, what do you know about Adma and Zebuim? I'm sure many of, many of you wouldn't have an answer. But if I were to ask you, what do you know about Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm sure many more would be able to say at least something about these places. Not so. Well, Adma and Zebuim were, were two nondescript towns that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. So what God is saying here is that he doesn't want the Israelites to become nothing more than a footnote in history. And then, after all the warnings that we've seen throughout Isaiah, it's almost as if out of the blue, God announces an about turn. Verse 8 to 9 say, My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again, for I am God, not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. Now why this change of heart? Three reasons. First of all, God's compassion is aroused. Secondly, he is God and not a man. And thirdly, he is the Holy One among you. You know, me, we may still understand something about the requirement that, that wrongdoing needs to be punished, e even though we may criticize God for punishing people. But when it comes to his love and his forgiveness of people that in no way deserve love and forgiveness, this is something that that we are really not capable of understanding. At a certain level, it may seem as if God is acting irrationally. Yet, what is being revealed here is God's divine plan with, which exceeds the limitations of our logic. So what is God's divine plan? That's our next point. Now, verse 10 stands in contrast to verse 1 and 2. In verse 1, we saw this image of a father calling his son. And in verse 2, we saw that, that despite continually being called, the more the people turned away from the father. 
But in verse 10, we see the same father calling with a powerful call, a powerful voice like that of a lion. And this time, we see the people responding to this call by coming. And then we also see a contrast between verses 5 and 11. In verse 5, verse 5 tells us that they will be sent back into slavery in Egypt and Assyria. But verse 11 has the people returning from Egypt and Assyria. And they will return no longer rebellious, but in submission to the Lord. That is God's plan. And that's Isaiah chapter 11. Now let me conclude. So in Isaiah thus far, we've seen over and over that the people have rejected God. And over and over we've seen the warnings of God's judgment. And the judgment all along has been said to, to be war which will result in exile to Egypt and Assyria. And that is what happened. But we also see in chapter 11 that this is not the end. Although the judgment will come, the judgment will not be like that of Admar and Zebuim. In other words, it will not be a total annihilation into obscurity. There will be a return to the land of Israel. And this also happened with the return of some of the tribes from the southern kingdom. So that's how it happened to the Israelites in the time of the Old Testament. But what about us today? I mean, even today, we have to know that sin must and will be punished. God is holy and just and he cannot leave sin unpunished. And God hates our sin as much as he did that of the Israelites in Isaiah's day. But there's more to God. Yes, he is a God of justice, but he also acts in love to spare his people. Now, how is this possible? How can God pass judgment on us for our sins while also sparing or saving us? Well, verse 1 of Isaiah 11 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now, as far as Hosea was concerned, this wasn't a prophecy of a future event. In fact, this refers to a past event, namely Israel's redemption from slavery in Egypt. But in his gospel, Matthew quotes this verse. And Matthew sees an analogy between verse 1 of Hosea 11 and Jesus. I mean, just after Jesus was born, Herod was killing all the babies born at that time in an attempt to kill Jesus. So Joseph and Mary, with baby Jesus, they had to flee for their lives. And then we read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 14, So he, that, that is Joseph, so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now the Israelites were rescued from slavery in Egypt. And this was God's plan of salvation in history for the Israelites. And this salvation of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt is, is one of the greatest Old Testament examples of God's love. But Matthew uses this as an analogy for God's love. We could say that, that because God loved the Israelites, he saved them from slavery in Egypt. But far greater than this, God's love was fulfilled or fully demonstrated in Jesus the Son of God. But not only was God's love fully demonstrated in Jesus, so too was his justice. You see, his wrath burned against our sins, but his wrath was quenched when Jesus died in our place. 
Jesus paid the price for our sins. And because of that, God's justice was fulfilled on our behalf by Jesus in dying on the cross. You see, Jesus stood on the receiving end when it came to God's punishment for our sins. But now we can stand on the receiving end of God's love. We certainly don't deserve God's love. The only reason we can be on the receiving end of God's love is because Jesus stood in for us to receive our punishment. So we can only receive God's love as a free gift. Isaiah 11 demonstrates for us that, that after a time of punishment, the nation of Israel will be restored. And the time of punishment for our sins is past if we trust in Jesus as our substitute. Isaiah 11 demonstrates that nothing can stand in the way of God's desire to love people. And one day, Jesus will return and judgment will take place. But those that trust in Jesus will not be judged for their sin because this judgment has already taken place on the cross. We read in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. And this refers to the uh, Jesus' return um, when he is coming to judge, uh, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance again we see this word repentance i mean this one thing that israel refused to do but for us the invitation is still open and if you have not accepted jesus as your savior why don't you you know, when coming to God, we have to believe that there's nothing in us that can commend us to God. Not our words or our works or our character or anything. Salvation is to be received only as a free gift because of Jesus' sacrifice of himself on our behalf. So if it is your desire to come to God for salvation, I want to invite you to pray with me. And if perhaps you, you believed in the past, but you've been drifting away, pray with me. The words will be on the screen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to be my saviour. I know I am a sinner, not deserving anything from you. But I hold on to your death as the punishment for my sin. In gratitude, I receive forgiveness for my sins. I thank you for dying in my place. I trust in you as my Savior, and I turn away from my sin to follow you. Amen. I hope this prayer is your prayer. And this prayer that we've just prayed, I'll put it in the description below If should you decide to pray it later on. If you prayed this prayer, why don't you use my email address which is in the description below and let me know about this. And then also I want to invite you to listen to the song God and God Alone as sung by Steve Green. And I look forward to sharing from Isaiah again next week with you. God bless you. Goodbye.